Many people, especially those around the Oriental Institute, have heard about Chicago House and the Epigraphic Survey. As a graduate student, to me, it was something, a graduate student in Egyptology, it was something sort of bigger than life. Um, certain graduate students would disappear. They'd go offshore to, to Luxor and get trained, and they'd come back as full-fledged Egyptologists and had this incredible mystique to it. So when I started writing the history of the epigraphic survey in 2020, it took me almost four years to write this book, I thought I knew most of the facts about the epigraphic survey in Chicago House, but um, I was really wrong. After reading several thousand letters in the archives here and in Luxor and in some German collections, I found out a lot that I didn't know, and I was very, very heartened when I would share some of these things with the staff of the epigraphic survey, and they said, we haven't heard that. We didn't know that. So I thought, I'm getting somewhere. So um, this voyage of reading other people's mail, which is quite satisfying, um, <laughs> introduced me to people, situations, and complexities that I really had no clue about. And hopefully, so I'm going to give you an outline of the epigraphic survey's history, because it's extremely interesting. But I'm also going to sort of intersperse it with little known facts and figures and um, bumps in the road, because from here it looks like, oh, the epigraphic survey, a century of work, it's all been so consistent and lovely. Well, it hasn't been. They have had to really struggle in some cases. Even the sheer existence of the epigraphic survey was threatened a number of times that we'll talk about. So starting with a quick outline of what was going on. So in case you don't know, epigraphy is the study is, is the discipline of studying inscriptions. And that, of course, was the work of this man, James Henry Breasted, the founder of the Oriental Institute, now ISAC. In his first career as a priest trainee, he noted the inaccuracies between the original Hebrew and Greek texts and the published King James Bible. And this completely turned him off being a priest. He said, I could never dare preach on the basis of inaccurate texts. And this really stuck with him his entire life, and it set his direction, his research agenda, for the rest of his life. In the following years, in the eight, late 1890s, he worked on the great Berlin Dictionary. So he had switched into Egyptology after he became disillusioned with the, with the priesthood. So he went to Germany, which is where Egyptology was at that point. There was no American Egyptology at all. And his job was to go through the different museums in, in Europe and copy any inscription that he found, all inscriptions that he found, on stele, statues, whatever, and compile those. And then the, those texts would be dissected and used to build the dictionary, the Wörterbuch, as it's called now. So he collected texts in museums. We have his wonderful copy books in the archives here at ISAC. So here are some of his notes, his hand copies of texts from some of these collections. So after he started collecting these texts and translating them, the hook was really set. In 1900, he wrote, if I, if I could only find some fellow ready to put in a few thousand a year for scientific work, I am now laying plans to copy all the inscriptions of Egypt and publish them. This is typical of Breasted. This man made no small plans. He thought in big, big, in some cases, audacious terms. And he was, in fact, a man of his word. Even without the desired patronage, he was able to distill his work on these historical inscriptions in museums into the four-volume ancient records of Egypt, which is in fact still consulted by people. Um, many of the inscriptions are a little dated, the translations, but it's still a very, very valuable book, published in 1906. Then in 1905 and 1907, with very little prior experience in Egypt, it was only on his honeymoon, he'd been there previously, he spent two seasons with a very small team, again, copying inscriptions as part of this goal to publish all of the historical inscriptions in the Nile Valley. So it was a team of two, so Breast is shown here in the middle, flanked by his photographer on the left and an artist on the right. And his son is shown on the lower right because his doctor was concerned about Breasted's health. Breasted always had kind of fragile health his entire life. And his doctor said, if you're going to go on this trip 
along the Nile in Egypt and Sudan, you must have a nurse with you. And so to save on the cost of the nurse, he got his wife to go with him. <laughs> and of course, with the wife came Charles, who is shown here. And in one of our wonderful photographs from our archives, this is uh, John Larson, our former archivist, referred to this as the Holy Family. But here, Mrs. Breasted in her frilly blouses and her you know, floor-length skirts and the hats, it's, and Charles forever with his sailor suit, traveled this incredible, incredibly difficult journey. And again, they basically had no idea what they're doing. Breasted had not been in this area. As I said, he had only been to Egypt for his honeymoon. And he, he set up this very complicated, very ambitious program, in, which involved leaving depots of supplies along the Nile. This guy was an incredible planner and was able to pull this off. So this expedition traveled as far south as Meroe. This shows Mrs. Nelson on a camel and Charles, sailor suit, as they're traveling along the Nile. So they traveled by camel and then by boat. They went as far south as Meroe in Sudan. And during this time, they copied, both hand copied, and made photographs of all of the inscriptions that they could find. Now, this sounds pretty audacious, but considering, look at the camera. It's an enormous wooden box camera with eight by 10 glass plate negatives. These glass plate negatives are being carried from Chicago to the Nile. They take a photograph, they take the plate down to the Nile and develop it to make sure they have a good image. Then they move the camera. Um, there are wonderful stories of this trip, of them almost losing the camera and all of their, all of their plates when one of the boats capsized in, in, on one of the cataracts. So it was an incredible, incredible trip. Unfortunately, Breasted never really did an account of this. His son wrote a book called Pioneer to the Past, and that has a lot of very good information, and I recommend it. But during this expedition, something very, very important and totally germane to the topic that I'm talking about tonight happened. And this was Breasted started to develop his system of copying inscriptions to create accurate facsimiles, so perfect copies of what that inscription or what the relief looked like. And this was, as he said, a combination of the speed of photography and the accuracy of the human eye. And so with this system, they would take a photograph, the plane of the glass plate negative was absolutely parallel to the wall to eliminate all distortion. It was then developed in the Nile and printed. And then Breasted would do what is called collation, which is a system of comparing what is on the wall to the photograph. This is a very early uh, record. This is from that expedition at Abu Simbel where he's gone to the, to the wall with his photograph, and you can see he's reinforced signs which are indistinct on the photograph, and on the adjacent piece of paper that's affixed to the photograph, he has then made other notes to clarify what the photograph is actually showing. So this was the beginning of what we now call the Chicago House method of epigraphy, or the Chicago method. So his big break came in 1919, when, he met John D. Rockefeller, Jr. And John D. Rockefeller, Jr. funded the, what became the Oriental Institute in 1919, and an enormous series of excavations that covered the entire ancient Middle East. At that time, the Oriental Institute in the, in the 20s and early 30s was the absolute leader in archaeology. We had expeditions in all the countries of the Middle East, often very large scale expeditions that were publishing these fabulous volumes and really set the reputation of Chicago in the Middle East. Now, Rockefeller's gift seemed at that time in 1919, 1920, like unlimited funding. And this is very important to remember the context because this gift and the economic situation in the United States is very much in contrast to Europe whose economies had been decimated by World War I. They were still struggling to recover. And Breasted steps in with all this Rockefeller money and this like unbridled ambition and ability to fund this sort of work, uh, which as you can imagine, there are some uh, issues coming up with um, conflicts with some of his colleagues. 
So the, the sort of plucky U.S. team, because they were plucky. They say, we're the only people who can do this. You know, we're Americans. You know, we're on the center stage now. The plucky Americans were really now at the center stage of field work with the very well-funded and ambitious Breasted at the forefront of this entire process. Because Breasted is an Egyptologist, but he's also um, in charge of developing all of the other excavations in Iran, Iraq, um, other countries as well. So in 1923, Breasted is sitting, as he recalls, in a wheelchair at the old Winter Palace Hotel. Uh, as I said, his, his health was quite fragile, and he actually describes being in a wheelchair. And he had this epiphany. He decided that he was going to do a no-holds-barred assault on the inscriptions. He recalled in his memoirs, sitting in a wheelchair in the beautiful gardens of the Winter Palace Hotel at Luxor, and referring to this in third person oddly, he dictated a plan of campaign for the development of an epigraphic survey of the temples of Egypt to begin with the great Medinat Habu temple opposite Luxor. Now, he sent a preliminary draft of this very bold plan to his former pupil and old friend Harold Nelson, who is shown upper middle in this photograph, who is then a professor of history at the American University in Beirut. Harold Nelson was a former student of Breasted who received his PhD from the University of Chicago. It was very good timing on Breasted's part because Nelson, although he loved Beirut and he was very, very dedicated to AUB, he complained that he was, quote, riding two horses for he, he was required to teach a, a wide range of classes in addition to Near Eastern studies. Um, he, and so he was dis, dissatisfied, but he loved Beirut. So this is gonna be kind of a hard sell for Breasted to peel him away from AUB. And Nelson further complained that with all of these different types of courses he's having to read, uh, teach in the committees, he said, either is a man-sized job and to try to do both at the same time is killing me and very hard on the students. So Breasted steps in, makes him an offer. So Breasted and Nelson meet in Cairo and Breasted shared his plan outlining, outlining what they could do with the Rockefeller funding and the commitment of the University of Chicago toward work in Egypt and Breasted's intent to publish the entire Karnak complex all of the Luxor Temple, all of the Ramesseum, the tomb of Ramses III in the Valley of the Kings, the Roman Temple at Deir el Suit. And then a couple of years later, he adds some more sites. He said, well, why don't we do Amarna? Uh, I think we should do nine Mastaba tombs at Saqqara. Oh, and let's do the Temple of Bechmeid al Hagar in the, in the Nile. Oh, and it would be nice to do the temple, the tombs of Beni Hassan. So, I mean, this is, this is the scale at which Breasted thought. I mean, he, he was absolutely incredible in his ambition. And he felt actually capable of doing it with this funding from Rockefeller. As he wrote, the Institute is now in a position to furnish the means, the men, and the equipment for doing this job. But he couldn't do it without Nelson. And Nelson was really his faithful right-hand guy. Really, without Nelson, this would not have happened. He served as Breasted's field director of Chicago House for 22 years, and in these 22 years, first of all, they got the survey off the ground, which is no mean feat. Uh, he oversaw, he hired and oversaw the scientific staff, he hired the other staff, he handled relations with the Egyptian government, he built two different Chicago houses. And he could not have done this without his wife, wife Libby, who's shown here on the right with their daughter Irene. By the way, we had the great-grandchildren of Harold Nelson here at, the, at, the, at ISAC recently. It was absolutely incredible. It was really very touching. Um, Mrs. Nelson, Libby Nelson, was no shy and retiring person herself. She was saddled with this enormous project of opening the houses, furnishing the houses, dealing with the staff, doing the menu planning, doing the shopping. A huge, huge project, but she was, she was totally up to it. Before she came to Egypt, before she married Nelson, she had been, been a visiting nurse in the hills of Lebanon, where she would, with her horse, with all her medical supplies, go around the hill villages and be the local medic. So this woman had a lot of, lot of guts. So um, the story of the two of them is really a lovely one. They were a true team in all of this. So 
with Harold Nelson on board, the epigraphic survey was born. And as Breasted first said, their starting point was Medina Tabu, the great complex of Ramses III here shown. So you can see the Western High Gate on the left. You can see the remains of the 60 foot tall mud brick enclosure wall. And part of the main temple in the middle is the Ramses III complex. Well, why did they start at Medina Habu? Very good reason. Nobody else was working on the reliefs, first thing. There had been excavations done, and in fact, there were excavations at the time they started. They started doing epigraphy in 1926, done, ironically enough, by another very well-known person, Harry Burton, who was the photographer for, photographer for the tomb of Tutankhamun. So it's a very, very incestuous sort of group of people. You see the same people doing different tasks in Luxor during this period. So of special interest to Breasted in particular, because he was a historian and epigrapher, were the scenes on the exterior north wall of this temple. They recall the, the foreign wars of Ramses III. Ramses III reigns begins around 1184 BC. Uh, it is the Libyan wars. The, the great uh, Sea People Wars, which are very, very interesting, and, the, the, and also the Nubian Wars. So it's a whole chronicle of the foreign wars of Ramses III, something that would really get Breasted's attention. It is um, such an enormous, significant, and complicated site that after a century, the survey is still working at that site, although they have worked at other sites in the meantime. Now, the first season, oh, and this is a view of one of the battle reliefs, these very complicated scenes. You can see how difficult it is to see what's going on on the left side of this scene with all of the, uh, the soldiers in disarray. And this is where Breasted's goal of making facsimile drawings of the reliefs really is important because the goal of these drawings is to separate the original drawing, the original relief, from the surface of the wall, so you can see what's actually there. So as it is now, it's, there's a lot of noise from the damage to the wall that disappears in the facsimile drawings. And if you go to the exhibit next door, you'll see the end result of these sorts of drawings. So the first season was a very small team. It was Nelson, a photographer here, John Hartman, on a really scary looking scaffolding. But there are scarier scaffoldings than if you, this, if you look in my book. I mean, some absolutely horrific things that they were, um, that they were using. Uh, and then one epigrapher, um, Al Alfred Bolliker, who was to stay with the survey for 11 years. By 1926, it was evident, really evident, they needed more staff. I mean, this is an enormous temple, and three people is not going to do it. And so Nelson and Breasted started planning again. And in 1926, they added three more epigraphers, Carolyn Ransom Williams, one of the early female greats in Egyptology, John Wilson, who later was a director of the Oriental Institute, and, uh, and Edgerton, William Edgerton, a famed uh, demoticist. And then they also added another artist, Virgilio Canziani, who was to work with the survey for 12 years straight, so that they had good continuity with the artists. They also needed a better facility and a research, society, a research facility, a research library. So this gives you an idea. This is actually 1927. So this is staff members and spouses and also some visitors. Some people of note in the second to the top row, third from the left, is Sir Alan Gardner. Any of you who have tried to learn hieroglyphs will know Gardner's grammar. That's the guy. Um, and then Breasted is right in the center with the white hair. His wife is to his left. To his right is Harold Nelson and Libby Nelson to his right. And Carolyn Ransom Williams, second from the left, second row from the top, in um, wearing a jacket and a tie because she's the only female in the group, and so she's fitting in. And you've noticed some of you may even have known John Wilson in the bottom second from the right, and his wife, Mary Wilson, who also happens to be wearing a tie. So it was, um, as we'll see, it was a little iffy with bringing spouses in these early days. So the original house that was built in 1924 is the old Chicago house, and we were very fortunate to be able to 
uh, borrow this spectacular plan and elevation, which is in the exhibit, that was done by Alfred, uh, by Pecky Callender, who, again, he was the engineer for the tomb of Tutankhamun clearance. So we got all the same cast of characters through here. So the, he designed this house with six bedrooms, uh, a lot of area for dark rooms and photographic areas in the sitting room. So you see the plan and elevation. Um, but this was not big enough. And in 1926, at the same time they added more staff, one thing that was very lacking was a library. They needed a research library. So in 1926, they added another building, which is the building to the right. And that added, so the building to the, the, the new building is at the top. That is the library building. Below is the old residence, which they have added onto tremendously to add new bedrooms um, and uh, more research areas. But the important thing is the upper area, the upper building is a library, which was absolutely essential for their research. It was, uh, the house was fitted out beautifully by Libby Nelson with this very peculiar furniture. Um, it, a big problem in Luxor is the white ant. And white ants eat anything organic. Like you've got to keep them out of libraries. You can't build in wood because they eat it. And so this furniture was actually made out of wire wrapped in paper to imitate wicker. And a lot of it is actually still in use at Chicago House. It's, it's pretty amazing. Now, again, with the correspondence we have about building the initial house and this expansion of the house in 1926, it was just amazing to me. There was no matter too small that Nelson did not have to check with Breasted about. Every single light fixture, every rug, every, you know, dishes, everything had to get the okay from Breasted back in Chicago. And it's, a, it's the complexity of doing this between Luxor and Chicago is absolutely astounding. And these guys were, were letter writers. They were writing two and three letters a day. Now, this expansion of the house raised a question that I alluded to earlier, which is whether the spouses of staff members could come live in Luxor. The problem is, or the fact was, the season was six months long, which is very long. Most archaeological seasons are maybe a month, maybe six weeks, and many are much shorter than that. And so it was quite natural that the scientists, as they were called, would want to have their spouses with them if they were going to be out of the country for six, six months. But there was considerable pushback and lack of empathy, which really surprised me. This is one of the things I was not prepared to read by Breasted, and particularly his son, Charles Breasted, who was his administrator. And Breasted himself wrote, I express my opinion regarding the Holshers, who is the archeologist, the Bullockers artists, and all the others who wish to park their families in the comfort of the establishment for a payment of board, which amounts to only a fraction of the actual cost to us. Kind of mean-spirited, actually. Um, the, continue, the conversation continued on and on, well, whether wives can come, can kids come, where they can stay, but usually the families won. 1930 was a pivotal year. In 1930, Breasted again got a renewed uh, sense of mission, and he decided to expand the mission far, far beyond Medina and Habu. If you remember when he was first talking to Harold Nelson, he had a much longer list of sites to work at. And so in 1930, these come to the fore again. This list was incredibly ambitious, especially until July 1930. They're making the requests before July 1930. They had not published anything. And the Egyptian government and antiquities organization wants to see that you're actually publishing things before you take on more projects. But Breasted didn't seem to care. So they hadn't published anything, and they start this incredible laundry list of additional things they want. Now, the person to whom this appeal is sent is Pierre Lecot, who is in the middle of the photograph in the tarbouche and the, and the beard, who, of course, by his name, as you can guess, is French. French were traditionally in charge of the antiquities organization in Egypt. And um, Pierre Lecot was a very, very powerful person. And these requests by Breasted raised a lot of eyebrows, particularly the eyebrows of Pierre Lecot. Because again, this issue of publishing versus the work. 
Lecoq was the most powerful man in the world of, of Egyptian antiquities. He had the power to give, to deny, or revoke ex expedition permits. So very, very important man. And it's very interesting to read the unsanitized correspondence between Nelson Breasted and Charles Breasted pertaining to Lecoq. A lot of it is and not very pretty. And a lot of it is really, if you want neo-colonial bad stuff, a, a lot of it's in my book, by the way. <laughs> um, but it's, I, I was shocked at some of this because everybody seems so collegial and everybody's getting along, but oh, the stuff that they were slinging between them was really amazing. So this request in 1930 to greatly expand the mission of the Epigraphic Survey was colossally bad timing. Just what were they thinking? Because it didn't help in 1930 that the University of Chicago, this is a, exceeded the boundaries of their agreed upon excavation. So Medina Habu is in the upper part of the, of the scene, and below are the ruins of the Temple of Ai and Horemheb, the successor to Tutankhamun, where the statue on the right, which graces our Egyptian gallery, the, the colossal statue of Tutankhamun, was discovered in December 1930. So already Lecoq was peeved at the Oriental Institute for exceeding the limits of their excavation. And it, was, it couldn't have been worse that the statue was thought to be Tutankhamun, because this is the time also when the tomb of Tutankhamun is in litigation, where the um, estate of Howard Carter is suing the Egyptian government and vice versa over who is the owner of the objects from the tomb. A very messy, very, very complicated lawsuit, and this happens right at this time. And Breston is also involved in that lawsuit, trying to be an intermediary, but the fact that this this and a pear statue, identified as Tutankhamun, was uh, discovered was really, really bad, bad timing. Breasted commented, this is bad because the name Tutankhamun is enough to set the river on fire. So any mention of Tutankhamun was inflammatory. And then on top of that, there was Breasted's, oh, here's the group for Tutankhamun. And then another thing to pile on this bad timing was in 1925, a few years earlier, Breasted persuaded Rockefeller to give something like $12 million to build an entirely new Egyptian museum campus in Cairo. It was um, a top secret. Uh, Breasted and the Chicago people did not tell any of their colleagues about it, which gives it kind of a fishy, fishy sense. And it was referred to in code in the letters as the great scheme or the great idea. So they didn't really want to tell people what they were planning. But again, this was colossally bad timing. The gift came with a stipulation that the vast museum campus was to be run by an international committee, i.e. not Egyptians involved, for 10 years before being turned over to Egyptian control. And again, this is right in the middle of the battle for Tutankhamun. It's like the Egyptians are, are really trying to advocate for their control over their own cultural heritage. And Breasted steps in with his plan to basically take that control away from them, them for at least 10 years. Uh, as one person has written, this gift of the museum would entail the virtual sale of Egyptian ancient monuments to America and would give Chicago the absolute monopoly in the antiquity service, which is another reason why the European colleagues of Chicago were not very happy with Chicago at this time. Oh, and then another thing, Breasted had requested permission to build an even bigger and obviously very permanent field headquarters in Luxor, the new Chicago house, which was viewed as another symbol of Chicago's attempt to dominate field work in the Luxor area. So, the requests. What did Breasted want to do? He wanted to publish Karnak. And if you've been to Karnak, which I'm sure many of you have been, you know it's an enormous sprawling uh, complex. And it was built from about 2000 BC into, um, into the Roman period. Um, a prob another problem with this request was Karnak was traditionally the purview of the French. And of course, Lacoa is French. And Lacoa is giving the permissions 
or not to work in these places. And although Lacoe played by the book, he was impartial, he was really, he is, somebody needs to do a, a biography of Lacoe. He's an extremely interesting and a very nuanced guy. He would fl favor French claims if it came down to it, although he gave Chicago much more ultimately than they expected he would. This request to do Karnak illustrates the, not only the ambitions, but really a kind of unfortunate sense of entitlement in Chicago's requests. Nelson wrote to Breasted, I am now going ahead to draw up a scheme of our proposed work. I have sent Laco a blueprint made from an enlargement from the map in Bedeker, Bedeker of course being the big guidebook at that point, uh, enclosing in red, in line, the Ramses III Temple and Babastite Gate here, not in red, but in purple, both of which he told me we could publish. And also, all of the temple east of the Amenhotep III pylon and the outer walls of the hypostyle hall as the areas in which we should be allowed to work. There is enough free area to keep us busy for years to come. So this is really, um, it goes beyond amb ambitious. This is a really an unreasonable request on the part of Chicago. Lacoe was not so enthusiastic about Chicago working at Karnak. He was suspicious about the ambitions of the well-funded like, uh, and very, very brash Americans and their request for monuments in addition to the enormous complex at Medina and Habu. And so he just thought that Chicago was being overextended and was, even, even the European colleagues of Breasted wrote him letters saying that this does smack a bit of a monopoly on the part of Chicago. Breasted wrote to, to Nelson, the intrusion of an American institution with the men and the money to publish these great monuments of primary importance evidently rankles. Lacoe expresses himself in the typical bureaucratic, bureaucratic French manner, and I think takes the greatest pleasure in his power of disposing of such rights. But Breasted and Nelson anticipated further resistance from Lacoe writing, and this is Breasted writing to, to uh, Nelson, the longer we can push off the inevitable struggle with Lacoe regarding our right to work at Karnak, the better. I think he's taking ample rope to hang himself. I should hate to undertake the job, but he wouldn't be the first Frenchman who has been thrown out. Really? I mean, certainly regarding our right to work at Karnak, no one had rights to work anywhere in Egypt. Oh, and then if that wasn't enough, 1930, they request working at Saqqara to do 10 of the major Old Kingdom Masta Bazaar, including T, Meruka, Tahotep, Idut, Kagemni, and some other ones. Oh, turns out Saqqara is also a place traditionally reserved for the French. <laughs> so it's, um, but in 1929, Breasted led John D. Rockefeller and his family through the Middle East. This is where they uh, explored Megiddo, and then it also came to Egypt. And he showed John D. Rockefeller the beautiful colored reliefs in the Saqqara tombs and got Rockefeller very, very interested in publishing this as a completely separate grant from funding of the Oriental Institute, funding of the Epigraphic Survey, and funding of the other expeditions. So he got Rockefeller to fund a new art historical study of ancient Egyptian paintings. And this is, quote unquote, personally financed, not from the foundation, but from Rockefeller, to the tune of then $200,000, which is $3.28 million today, for five years of field work and a final year for editorial work. Again, this is all on top of the other funding that Rockefeller is giving. Breasted, again, had incredibly grandiose plans for Saqqara. He initially projected they would publish five fol folios. Then he said, well, let's do 10 folios with a total of 658 plates. So this is enormous, enormous publication project they're talking about. And if we have time, we'll come back to this project because this is a project that really didn't, wasn't very successful. Uh, with all this activity and increasing staff, Chicago did, in fact, need larger headquarters, and Lacoe did finally give the go-ahead to build a new house on the opposite bank in Luxor, on the east bank. Ironically enough, it was just down the street from Lacoe's house. 
And so this was the new Chicago House that was built in 1931. This is the existing Chicago House that many of you may have had the good fortune to visit. And this was, um, doing the research for the book, I found fascinating series of different prov provisional plans, all these different ideas they had of what this project would be, what Chicago House would be. So this is one of the early plans. On the bottom to the right is a residence, to the left is a library, and then outstations on the opposite so corners of the plots. The architects were Lawrence uh, Ting Hunter and, excuse me, Leonard, Leonard Hunter and Lawrence Woolman. And by the way, Lawrence Woolman's son was here for the opening of this show. So again, it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, so here they are planning. And the final plan is shown here, showing the residence to the right, the library and studios to the left, connected by an arcade, and then the uh, workshops and the photographic areas to the back with the obligatory tennis court on the left. Charles Breasted decided every field headquarters should have a tennis court. And so Megiddo, Megiddo also had a tennis court. Tim is saying, yep. So this house, this is what it looked like before it was landscaped. So obviously a permanent presence is what they're doing here. It is built in sort of a, a, a Moorish Spanish style. Very beautiful, again, the, the residence to the right, the library and studios to the left, and the interior. The vintage photographs don't look that much different than it looks today. And this is the tea room and the sitting room. So the 1930s were very, very productive with Nelson at the helm. Volumes appeared of the Epigraphic Survey appeared in 1930, so toward the end of the year, 30, 32, 34, 1940. The excavation series from the Dean of Habu were published in 1930, 32, 34, 1940. So they were finally putting out publications at a very, very good clip and were proving to people that they could really do this work. There are a lot of letters of concern about the very first volume of the epigraphic survey that Nelson and Breasted were very concerned about how it would be received, how the reviews would be, if they'd be positive or negative, because they said, this book has to be so exemplary that nobody can say there's anything wrong with it or else they're going to just say we're a bunch of like overfunded kids working in Luxor. But in fact, the reviews were very, very positive. In 1932, this is actually a picture from 1935, the survey consisted of Nelson, three additional Egyptologists, then Siegfried Schott, uh, Keith Seeley, and Rudolf Antis, six artists, a photographer, a librarian, a house manager, Nelson's secretary, a full-time resident engineer mechanic who looked after the fleet of cars and two boats, all in addition to about 30 Egyptian staff who worked in the house and assisted the epigraphers and artists in the temple. So as you can see, this project grew like Topsy. It became a very, very large expedition. But what goes up sometimes has to come down and think about what time we're talking about, 1935, the crash. And this is where um, Anne Flannery's exhibit is very interesting about the devaluation. So there were warnings of challenges, economic challenges in 1934, when the US enacted the Gold Reserve Act and the dollar was devalued. Suddenly the purchasing power of Rockefeller's dollars were cut in half, that's the 50 cent man, and suddenly, uh, and then Chicago, because they were struggling with their own budgets, had to cut the budget of Chicago House a further 80%. So basically, this is like on you know, life, life support. In 1937, the staff was back to what it was in 1924. It was different. It was Harold Nelson still, but a single photographer and a single artist. Luckily, John Wilson then, who was director of the Oriental Institute, a former epigrapher with the Epigraphic Survey, and a man who, from all the letters I've read, comes off as one of the most decent men. And maybe some of the older people in the audience actually met John Wilson. He, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't. I, he's an incredible man. Very empathetic, extremely smart. Um, 
John Wilson worked with Nelson on solutions after, after one of the other uh, field missions of the Orientalists were closed down. Persepolis was closed, Megiddo was closed, the, the, uh, Amuk was closed, everything was closed down. They were able to save only the epigraphic survey in Luxor. After the, the staff cuts, Nelson was limping along. They decided to work primarily at Karnak because they were living on the same side of the river as Karnak. The budget was so bad, they thought if they went to Medina and Habu, it would cost too much in fuel for the boats and cars to, tra to go across the river. So they restricted their work to Karnak as, again, part of this super budgetary cut. Now, on top of this, on top of the, the Depression, the Rockefeller money had been scheduled to terminate in 1939, and there was no secret about that. So they should have known what was coming. It was exacerbated by the Depression. But again, Breasted died in 1935, but there was this kind of chipper idea that they could get, uh, they could get Rockefeller to continue his funding past his, his declared 1939 cutoff. He didn't. He was not interested in funding any more of the expeditions of the University of Chicago after 1939. So as they're running up to this big crunch, in 1936, letters between Nelson and, and Wilson refer to things like the problem of the Luxor house. This is the beautiful big headquarters they just built. This is the problem now. They discuss plans to move back to the west, to the old house that they still had there. And they talked about just closing this beautiful new house that was only five years old at that time and to rent it out or sell part of it. We have all these letters talking about, well, should we move into the library or move out of the library? Which part should we rent? Which part should we sell? How can we do this? Uh, they were doing everything they could to try to figure out how to salvage this. They thought they could run it as a pension for visiting scholars. They considered selling it to King Farouk for a summer residence. Um, the, the letters on that are a little racier about the harem. Um, luckily for the future, they got no appropriate offers for the house. They got no offers that they could even possibly entertain. And luckily by 1939, the crisis had abated in, and they were, the financial situation had stabilized. Okay, then the next big crisis, of course, is World War II. So the house, the survey closes from April 1940 and reopened in October 1946. Again, Nelson supervised the survey and its return to Luxor in 1945 to prepare it for the 1946 season. And extremely interesting letters about the condition of the house and who had been left as caretaker. There had been thefts. Um, luckily, the house had escaped sequestration by the British Army, which was a possibility. So there was a skeleton, skeleton crew at the house. Um, all in all, the house weathered it quite well. All the teapots were stolen and the silver teaspoons and the blankets, but they could... Actually, that was pretty good timing because the Metropolitan House closed down their house and they sold their stuff to Chicago. So, a good way of replenishing. So the work in the post-war post years focused on Medina Tabu and Karnak under the leadership of Richard Parker, shown here on the right, at a tea party with the Egyptian officials. And then he was... Uh, field director from 47 to 48, and especially George Hughes, who I'm sure many of you knew. He was field director from 1948 to 57 and 58 to 1963. And another amazing man, empathetic, clever, great manager, brilliant, um, and hilarious. His letters are very, very witty. And then also um, under his successor, Charles Nims, shown here with his wife Myrtle, who is field director from 63 to 71. Now, although Luxor is a bit of a backwater, Chicago House did experience and endured the important political events in Egypt in the mid-20th mid century. And this is something I wanted to focus on in the book, is how archaeology is buffeted by political events. Because archaeologists don't work in a vacuum. You have to deal with the current political climate. So, for example, in 1951, there were anti-American riots, reading up the 1952 Egyptian Revolution when King Farouk was overthrown. In November, 
Hughes receives a message from the Liberal Battalion of Luxor, uh, ordering him to expel all of his survey's British employees. And there were quite a few of the artists and also the resident engineer who were UK citizens. Uh, and, quote, as a first step, the English nameplate on the outside of the door should be removed. We not responsible for all the damages that will happen to the Institute after that. And Hughes talked about there were sound trucks passing back and forth the gates, uh, blaring for the Americans and the, and the British to get out of Luxor. So very unnerving. But good old, good old Hughes, um, George Hughes at this time was the director, and he, he was unflappable. Uh, so he assured the director, Carl Kraling, director of the Oriental Institute, he says, personally, I don't think there's anything to get panicky about at the moment. And I shall not leave if there's any possibility at all of going on with our work. The people of Luxor and the officials are, are, are our friends. Well, one of the artists, um, Alexander Floroth, who lived ordinarily in Cairo, uh, was in Cairo in early January 1952 during that season. He was there and witnessed the riots, the uh, Black Saturday that occurred that led to the burning of the core of downtown Cairo on January 26. According to Hughes, Mr. Floroff reports it is even worse than we have heard. Also, we learned just this morning of the government. Everything is always here, but we are interested, let us say, about what may develop. Now, Hughes and others at Chicago House reacted very positively to the 1952 revelation, uh, revolution. They were not at all threatened by the idea of an Egyptian government for Egypt. Hughes wrote of a new hope, a new outlook on the part of the people that could not have been expected. And he writes very movingly of seeing President, uh, president Mohammed Naguib, he's the first president of Egypt uh, before Nasser. Uh, Naguib visited Luxor in late 1953, excuse me, late March 1953, when he gave an address from the veranda of the Winter Palace Hotel I unfortunately was not able to find photographs of this. It would have been great. For which Hughes recalled the entire town turned out. And Hughes wrote about being very impressed with the several demonstrations of Naguib's humility, writing, we are as enthusiastic about him as we are his Egyptian countrymen. Now, four years later was another major event, the Suez Crisis, when France, Britain, and Israel attacked the Sinai. In November 1956, the American consul advised all Americans to leave Egypt. Hughes reported, we have had many moments of uncertainty and much discussion with people at the American mission here about what to do. We heard about the elaborate evacuation plans for Americans, but we all decided there was no need to leave immediately where no children were concerned. After all, we'd just arrived and were peacefully at work, so we didn't want to leave hastily for no good reason and look foolish. Then very soon, it was no longer possible to leave, and that decisively settled the problem. <laughs> um, Ed Wente, who many of you know, who was a professor of Egyptology here and was also field director for several, 1970, 1971, 72, was then at a graduate student during the Suez Crisis. He was a graduate student on a Fulbright Fellowship in Cairo, and he witnessed the bo bombing of Cairo, and he wired Luxor and asked if he could shelter in the relative safety of backwater Luxor where nothing was going on. And Hughes wrote, of course, uh, when he is shown here on the left. Hughes wrote, of course, on the night he arrived, November 1st, there was staged for us the first of a series of brilliant and noisy displays at our local airport. We have often talked idly about wanting to be safely in Luxor when another war broke out. And little did we imagine that we would one day stand on the roof of Chicago House or peer from the Osiris suite of Ramses III's mortuary temple and watch bombs drop and anti-aircraft shells burst over Luxor. The biggest issue of these events was really whether the government would issue visas. And this was the real rub. No visas, no work for both the British and the Americans. And so provisions were made for canceling the field seasons and turning them into study seasons where the staff would stay in the UK or the US and do their work from there. In 1950, the work resumed, um, and they, they actually had a, a really clever guy, a fixer from RC, uh, a, a white M Russian, and he was a, a master at getting visas. And so he, he fixed all the visas for, for Chicago House. <clears throat> 
Um, in the 1950s, they were working entirely in Medina Habu, and Ro uh, Hughes wrote, for the first time since I've been on the ex expedition, we have not had to spend a minute anywhere except at Medina Habu. Now, the 1960s saw real cha challenges with funding, so much so that the very existence of the epigraphic survey was questioned. In 1962, there were discussions whether it should be disbanded and the faculty be repurposed along the lines of an American school in Jerusalem as an international research center for resident scholars. Hughes wrote to Oriental Institute director Robert McCormick Adams, quote, the only thing to do with Chicago House is what is being done, excuse me, being done with it now, the job which it was set up to do as no other outfit has ever been. It is probably the most unspectacular longest term and one of the most important jobs being done in Egyptology, a job which nobody else is equipped to do or wants to do, but which the French Institute has been politically forced into doing in an inadequate manner, and which the internationally sponsored Centre Documentation in Cairo is admirably planned to do and does miserably. Well, only two years later, there was another financial crisis it was so dire that there were again discussions about the viability of the survey, and it was saved fortuitously by the PL 480 program, which some of you older people might remember. PL 480 uh, program involved monies held by the US government as credits for grain, American grain purchased by other countries, primarily Egypt, India, uh, and other developing countries. Some brilliant person in the State Department devised a program under which those credits in the foreign currency, so Egypt would owe the United States one billion Egyptian pounds, let's say, those credits would be given to cultural insti American cultural institutions who were working in those countries to which the currency corresponded. And so they, the these cultural institutions like Chicago House could use that money, the credits of Egyptian pounds, to pay the expenses that were payable in local currency, freeing up the smaller amount of hard currency, the dollars, for other costs. It was an absolute lifesaver. Um, under the program in 1965, Chicago House re received $22,000, which doesn't sound like that much, but it was about $250,000 in today's dollars, which allowed them to pay many of their in-country expenses with local currency. This was a lifeline, really. It was an absolute lifesaver that lasted through the NIMS, Wente, and Kent Weeks directorships. Kent Weeks was 1973 to 75. One of Weeks's strategies to speed up the rate of publications, thus justifying the University of Chicago's expenses, was by doing pr two projects that he perceived were quick and of limited uh, duration. One was the battle reliefs of Seti I at Karnak. The, those were recorded from 1973 to 1976. And then a project that turned out to be not very quick at all was the documentation of the Opet reliefs at the Luxor Temple, which started in 1973 and is ongoing because this is a project that, like Topsy, grew and grew and grew and grew. Uh, part of the issue with, with it is as they were documenting the opet reliefs, you can see a photograph. The opet reliefs are on the inside of the colonnade hole walls, the interior walls. They realized that the upper registers of those walls were missing. So originally those columns you see were inside, were enclosed by the side walls. So this, those columns were like in a big shoebox of stone. And so the problem was where are those missing blocks? to be able to complete the OPET reliefs. And so that began a big project of the Luxor block project. And very important to this was Ray Johnson, who I know most of you know, former director of Chicago House, who has a very, very keen eye, started to identify blocks, just loose blocks around the, the temple that were of the same material, style, and scale of the OPET reliefs. And so they started sorting out these blocks, and there were thousands and thousands of blocks around the, around the Luxor Temple that Ray was dealing with. They eventually were able to even replace many of these blocks in, on the walls. And this is an ongoing project. Now, Lanny Bell, who was field director from 1977 to 78, faced his own financial crisis, and in 1981, 
PL 480 was disbanded. And the discussion about the viability of the survey again resurfaced. This time, it was, uh, as some people said, focusing on the underutilized facility, in other words, Chicago House, because it was only used by the survey for six months of the year. It was uh, then some ideas were floated as a summer institute for expedition members or individuals doing independent research or that the survey would be disbanded entirely and Chicago House would be rented to other missions using the income to support modest Egyptological research. And there are some other even, uh, well, what Lanny Bell deemed to be really bad ideas. Um, one was sell the complex and use the capital for an endowment to support Egyptological researches research projects or turn the property over to the Egyptian government in exchange for a 99-year lease. And so Lanny Bell, like many of his predecessors, had to shift back from his scientific work to fundraising. And this brings up somebody who many of you will know. So Lanny Bell with his wife Margaret, excuse me, Martha. This brings up Carlotta Maher well known to many people in this room. Uh, Carlotta Maher was the assistant to Lanny Bell, and jointly they launched into a fundraising frenzy. Carlotta being very, very famous for sending innumerable handwritten notes to donors. Uh, they instituted paid library tours. The one on the right is obviously not a paid library tour since it's Hillary and Chelsea Clinton, but the paid library tours were a good source of fundraising. They started a group called Friends of Chicago House, or Folk, and they did an annual uh, tour, the Folk Tour, and the Folk members were primarily business uh, expats in Cairo, members of the business community, people who were very interested, they had means, if they got interested in Chicago House, they were a very good means of support for Chicago House. So this is just one of these Folk Tours at Chicago House, and it was a time when, when all the people at Chicago House got to dress up, which they liked a lot. But it did, Lanny and Carlotta did a tremendous amount to raise the profile and at least piecemeal funding of Chicago House. And indeed, the situation stabilized. In 1992, something absolutely pivotal happened. In 1992, there was a cultural endowment from the US government consisting of undisbursed PL 480 funds. And they were, they were divided between Chicago House, the American Research Center in Egypt, and the Fulbright Binational Commission in Egypt. And this created an endowment that took the heat off Chicago House and allowed them to feel financially more secure. So this windfall, along with the devaluation of the Egyptian pound, allowed then field director Peter Dorman to do badly re delayed repairs and improvements to the infrastructure. Lanny had done what he could, he was like, trying to tape things together, but Dorman with the new endowment and the devaluation of the pound did an enormous rebuild. They did, redid the plumbing, the wiring, uh, the tiles. They expanded the library. So this is the library emptied of all the books before they expanded it. Um, they also redid the kitchen. The uh, before is above and the after is below and the um, Kathy Dorman, who was the mudira, the, the mistress of the house, uh, fondly remembers like all of the little cans of kerosene underneath the, the legs of the of kitchen equipment so that the ants couldn't get in and, and the, the suit filling up the kitchen from faulty kerosene ovens. And so the kitchen was beautifully rebuilt along a sort of industrial commercial uh, plan. This was all done in, in two, two seasons with no disruption to the survey, which is absolutely amazing. This, um, this endowment left Ray Johnson, a field director from 1996 to 2021, with a much better financial situation in which he, although very concerned about finances and still concerned with fundraising, could focus more on the core mission. So the survey is still working at Luxor Temple, now under the direction uh, and Medina Habu, now under the direction of Brett McLean. And they've added new techniques to the Chicago method. And if you're interested in the Chicago method, it's all spelled out in the exhibit next door. But they have integrated more computer technology into the system here. Uh, Kelly Alberts and Sue Osgood working on a Wacom tablet, uh, which has replaced some of the inking that the artists used to do. 
So after a century, the epigraphic survey continues its mission of documenting and publishing the reliefs and inscriptions and publishing these highly accurate facsimile drawings, which will outlast the temples. Thank you very much. Oh, actually, we do have just a couple minutes. I want to, okay, everything sounds pretty good, right? I want to talk about something that wasn't so good. Okay, this is the Saqqara expedition. Okay, so what happened to the Saqqara expedition started with very ambitious plans that I talked about, the idea of doing 10 folios under the direction of Prentice Duell, shown here, and a small staff. Uh, the immediate problem was the Antiquity Service uh, denied their, their request to build a mini Chicago house in the necropolis of Saqqara. Leco said, you may not do it. Then there was conflict with the Antiquity Service over what they were allowed to do in the necropolis at all with their work. Rather than 10 Mastaba tombs, they focused on two, Mararuka and Edut. But this is very, very bizarre because it appears that most of their budget went into building their field headquarters and not into the work. I slapped him. <laughs> and this, this is what the little Saqqara house looks like. It was built on the, on the foundations of the old Pennsylvania house. It was a beautiful big house designed by uh, Lawrence Woolman, who also worked on Chicago House. Um, and here is Lawrence Woolman and his wife, Janet, who is interior decorator, who's, who did the interiors of the house. This was a very odd place. Uh, this was the entrance, very beautiful. But a whole west, the whole left wing of the house was for the director exclusively, <laughs> which seems very weird. So this is his sitting room. This is the director's library. This is the library at the Saqqara House. Notice there is one chair. So this is not a library that the other staff members are going to feel very welcome using. This is the director's sitting room and bathroom. And there were delays and, oh, this is what a, a staff bedroom looked like. There were six staff bedrooms. There were delays, absences of the field director, interpersonal issues, uh, the wife of the field director ran off with one of the artists. Um, and there's this, I, I found a telegram where, where Prentice is saying, I am not renewing Stekolovsky, who ran off with his wife or vice versa, uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and Nelson commented, this is a really great dry comment, just how anyone managed to work there, I do not know. In 1936, Wilson told Duell that he had to wrap it up. This is all part of the retrenchment and, and the, the big financial crash. Duell seemed incapable to present a pared down budget. Rather than presenting a pared down budget, he presented Wilson with a larger budget, which Wilson was completely befuddled by. And then ultimately, Wilson found that he had to borrow funds from the ancient Egyptian paintings budget to even publish the two volumes of Meruruka that ultimately were finished. So not everything was perfect. Thank you very much.